is to come on up this morning. Come on up, guys. Good to see you guys. How's everybody doing? Man, y'all look good. If you're doing as good as you look, then you are doing good. All right, this morning, I want to ask you a simple question. Has anybody had anything to drink since you woke up this morning? Yeah. Everybody? Why do you have something to drink? Get thirsty because you were thirsty. Exactly right. Who wants something to drink now? Are you thirsty? All right, here you go. I'll get a couple of you. Who wants something to drink? There, Easton. Who's up front here? Here, Ashley. All right, here, Olivia. Okay. All right, let me just start with those three, okay? All right, we'll get you something to drink. All right? Now, um, as far as what water does for you, somebody tell me what it does for you when you drink it. What's it do? It hydrates you. It hydrates you. That's a good answer. What else? What, a, what else? If, if your mouth, mouth is dry, it won't be dry anymore, right? The Easton. So you'll be healthy. Those are great answers. You know, water is the best drink in the world. So um, you want water? There you go. So what do you have to do to get water? That's good. Say the magic word. What is it? Please. Please what? Please doesn't tell me anything. Please what? Please can I have water? So that's all you have to say. All right. Well, Blake, let me use you as an example. Can you come up here? All right. Blake, are you thirsty? Always. Always? All right. Now, how thirsty are you? Very. Okay. Very thirsty. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So let me ask you this. If I were to open this pack of cheese crackers... <coughs> One of the greatest inventions that God ever put here, toasted cheese, right? How many people has been helped out during your day by one of these right here? Amen. You've got to thank him for the little things, right? Now, Blake, you're thirsty, yeah. right? Yeah. All right. Would you like some water? I'd love some. Okay. Have that cracker. Okay. Have a cracker. That's the way to eat it. Mm -hmm. when, how many people bite it in two or how many people bite the whole cracker? I watch when people do that. I bite... Yeah, no, I bite the whole cracker. Good? Mm -hmm. Good. You like that? Yeah. No peanut allergies or nothing, I hope. Oh, right. 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 Good? Good. Have another one. Huh? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Good? Good. Have another one. Have another one. Not, I'm feeding him. He, he's, 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 this guy's always hungry. Always hungry. Believe me. Always eating something. Right? All right. All right. All right. Now. Now. Did you guys say you wanted water? You did. But what did you have to do? Thank you. What did you say? Please what? There you come here. Get you some water. Whoops. All right, anybody that wants water, that's what you're... Here, let's hold it this way. Take a sip of that, tell me what you think. You guys just want cups, you don't want water? You said you were thirsty. You kept saying you were thirsty. All right, here you go. Sure, come here, Olivia. There you go. Swish it around in your mouth. Doesn't it feel good? Doesn't it? Doesn't it feel good? Now, really, you just eat the middle out of them? Yeah, some people do that too. But you know, you guys didn't really need water. You just wanted water, so you weren't really, I had to, I had to try to tell you to ask me, ask me. But when you really need water, then you're going you're gonna to ask in a loud way, aren't you? Now, do you know anybody up here that might really need water? Right, right. Exactly. And you know what? You know what? Sometimes that happens to us. Things happen to us in life 
We think we might need Jesus, but sometimes things happen where we really know we need him, where we can't do anything without him. And, you know, sometimes you might, you might just take water because you want it, but sometimes you need water. Blake, do you need water? Yes. Then I want to hear you ask for water like water, you need. Please. <laughs> please, can I have water? May I please have water? Sir, please give me water. <laughs> now, do you need water? I need it. Would you rather have another cracker or water? Water. So yeah. water is what you want right now. Water is what I need right now. Water is what you need right now. Did you hear that? He needs water. You know what? He was asking several times. And you know what that's called? Begging. Well, it's not called begging. No, no. Here's the difference. Here's the difference. Whenever you ask for something that you think you want, you sort of ask for it. But when you really need something, if you were really thirsting to death, do you know that if you saw water up here, you would start saying, Pastor Mike, Pastor Mike, please give us water. Please give us water because we're so thirsty we're going to die or, or our mouth is so dry, wouldn't you? Do you know that that's the way that we have to come to God sometimes? You know, sometimes we come to God and we just say, God, we love you. This is what we need. This is what we want to do. But sometimes things happen in our lives and we cry out to God. Put your gun back in your mouth. Put your gun back in your mouth. All right. Sometimes things happen and we have to cry out to God and we cry out desperate. We say, God, please, please help me. Please help me. Do you know that, that God wants us to come to him that way sometimes? He wants us to be able to cry out to him. Say that word, cry out. That's different than just saying, eh, I'll take water. It's different when you cry out and say, please, please give me water. Do you know that, that God tells us to come to him and cry out to him? Now, how do you cry out to God? What are some things you can do to cry out to God? How, what? Next person, how do you cry out to God? You pray, right, exactly, you pray. But you don't beg. You're not begging, you're just telling God, I believe you can do it, but I'm crying out to you. And do you know what? As you get older, sometimes there's going to be some things that happen in your life that are going to cause you to cry out to God not ordinary ways, not like every day when you just pray, but these times it will make you say, God, please give me this or else I'm going to die. And so that's how God wants us to cry out to him. Who wants to cry out to God? Do you know that the first thing you ever get to do is cry out to God to be his child? You have to cry out to him and say, God, I'm a sinner. I'm lost. Please, please save me. And then after that, you're able to keep crying out to God. So how many people think it's important to cry out to God? You cry out to God in your prayers. So make sure when you say your prayers, you're not just saying prayers that are just like, oh God, please let this happen, please let this happen. He's listening to you to see if you really want it, if you really need it. So you need to pray to him in a way to where you cry out to him, okay? All right, pray with me. Lord, I love you, I praise you, I thank you for all that you do. I pray, God, that you would just minister to these children, let them learn, Lord, the importance of crying out to you for what they need. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Now, what would you like? Would you like some gummies? Yes. All right. Let me see these cups first. Let me see that cup. All right. Oh, you guys drunk at all, didn't you? Here you go. Okay. There you go. Here you go. No, we're not doing crackers. We're doing gummies. Okay. And when are you going to eat these gummies? After you leave church, right? Here you go. In the car would be good. Yep. You can eat them after a nap. That's good. That's good. Here you go. Here you go. Gummy, you are my only home. All right. There you go. You're welcome. You're welcome. You're welcome. Thank you. You're welcome. You're welcome. Thank you. You're welcome. You're welcome. You're welcome. I like y'all's manners this morning. Thank you. You're welcome. 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 Give me five. Here you go. You. You're welcome.
How many people have your Bibles this morning? If you have your Bible, stand up and raise it above your head. Bear witness of God's Word. Amen. That's beautiful. You may be seated. Turn, if you would, please, to the book of Luke, chapter 18. Luke, chapter 18. When you find your place, say, I have it. Luke 18. Everybody have it? I want to start by saying, God had laid this sermon on my heart, knowing that it applies to each one of us. It applies to me. It applies to you. And I think there are certain things in life that we take for granted. I think there are certain things in our Christian life that we take for granted. I think we get used to being in some situations that we're in, and we go about changing those situations the wrong way. I don't know if you have. I know I have. Can I get a witness? You ever tried to change it? Have you ever found yourself in a situation that just doesn't seem to be changing? Anybody in here? I noticed something, and in the role of a pastor, I get the privilege, and yes, I do say the privilege, of, of being able to walk through a lot of difficult times with people. You say, is that a privilege? Well, it is. But I notice that when you walk through difficult times with people, the one thing that I see a lot of is crying. I see a lot of people cry. And crying is a natural response. When something sad happens, we do what? When we get hurt and there's pain, what happens? When you have loss, what do you do? And sometimes you get so frustrated in life and nothing seems to be going your way that you feel like the emotions take over and, and you just cry. Some people cry inside, some people cry outside. You can have somebody that says, well, I don't cry. I'm going to tell you, you either cry outside or you cry inside. Crying inside sometimes, uh, that's a tougher deal. You say, what do you mean? You know, you cry inside sometimes when you begin to look at your life and you think, this is never going to change. And you begin to cry in your attitude and cry in your emotion. It looks like frustration. It looks like anger. It looks like resentment. It looks like discouragement. That's crying on the inside. It looks like you're defeated. It could happen in a relationship. It could happen with a financial situation. It could happen with some kind of health diagnosis, and inside all of a sudden you begin to cry, and then sometimes it, it makes its way outside, and you begin to cry outside. That's crying. You say, anything wrong with crying? I think crying is good for us. It's healthy. I think it's a natural response to pain, whether it be a distinct physical pain or whether it be an emotional pain. Do you agree? But there's a different kind of crying that the Bible talks about, and Today I want us to look at the difference between crying and crying out. Crying and crying out. You see, there's a difference between crying and crying out. When trouble happens in our lives, we have a choice about it. You know, this is the choice. We have a choice to cry and keep crying, or we have a choice to cry out. You know, I believe that one of the first things that happens, it's, it just happens in our body. We begin to cry. It's our, our natural state that we do. Whether you cry out loud or you cry inside. But I believe also that you will stay in the same position that you're in. The same trouble. The same consequent if you choose just to cry. But I want you to see today that the Bible tells us if we don't just cry but we cry out then is when the situation changes. There's a difference between crying and crying out. You know that by definition, when I say the word cry, you can imagine somebody crying. You can see a kid running to you and saying, I fell down, I hurt this, and I'm crying. Or, or listen, I'm sad, and I'm crying. Or, or I got lost, and I'm crying, and by myself, I'm crying. And then we see how we cry. So we know what crying is. But crying out, that's to be able to, to cry out like, help me, help me. That's a cry, isn't it? To cry out. You say, well... What does the Bible say about it? A lot. 
If you look back through the Bible, you will see that the word cry out, it's not the word, the two words, the phrase cry out is used hundreds of times in the Bible. Hundreds of times in the Bible. And it's not by coincidence. I believe that it is used because we overlook our ability to cry out to God. I believe we stay in a condition so many times of just crying but not crying out that our situation never changes. And God is trying to say, hey, it's right here. Hey, it's right here. Hey, it's right here. Hey, it's right here. Look in your word. What did I tell you to do? Cry out to me. But we always have another plan, a way that we're going to fix this situation or that situation, don't we? And then it doesn't work. And guess what? We end up doing even more crying at some point in time we have to move from crying to crying out if we want resolution and if we want healing in exodus chapter 2 and i told you to turn to luke so don't turn to exodus i'm just going to walk you through a timeline here you can if you want to if you're one of these quick flippers you can exodus 2 we're told about the children of israel you remember joseph Well, he was leading Egypt. When he was leading Egypt, his family ended up coming there. Well, everything was great because they were in a time of famine. They came to Egypt. They had food. But after the king died, well, the new king didn't like the children of Israel. So they became slaves in bondage. How many people know that part about the Bible? So we know that. So as they became slaves in bondage, we read in Exodus 2, 23, it says, And it came to pass in the process of time that the king of Egypt died, and the children of Israel Sighed by reason of bondage. And I like this phrase, they sighed by reason of bondage. How many of us go through typical days and life just gives us a curveball and all of a sudden we find ourselves in a physical or a mental, (sighs) right? Now, disgusted or whatever it is we are, we sigh and they were sighing, They they were defeated. But here's what they did. The Bible says they sighed by reason of bondage. But listen, and they cried out. And their cry came up to God by reason of bondage. Well, we know what happened. God sent Moses to deliver them from bondage. And God sent plagues to the people of Egypt until Pharaoh released them. They were delivered and they cried out, right? They weren't too far gone from Egypt when they met an obstacle at the Red Sea. And Pharaoh had sent his army. So they were trapped. They got to something they couldn't see their way around. And they had something coming up behind them that they knew was going to be able to hurt them. You ever been in that situation? Not at the Red Sea, but in regular life. Can I get a witness? Anybody? What happens? Worry, fear, depression, disgusted, resentful. And the first thing they began to do is cry. Why did you bring us here? It wasn't even our fault. We could have stayed there. We could have done that. But then they were told, Stop crying and start crying out. Listen, Exodus 14, 10, it says, And when Pharaoh drew nigh, the children of Israel lifted up their eyes, and behold, the Egyptians marched after them, and they were sore afraid. And listen, and the children of Israel cried out unto the Lord. You'll see if you read the rest of what happens in this chapter that God parted the Red Sea and the children of Israel were delivered from their fears and their troubles and their problems, right? Joshua later reminded them of this in Joshua 24 when they were complaining again. You know, when they were complaining, that was just a state of crying. You say, well, I'm going to leave here today. And Pastor Mike has said, if you're crying, you're complaining. I'm not. I'm saying crying is a natural reaction. But when that crying turns into a resentment or, or why is this happening to me or I don't have this answer and why is everybody else doing this and why can't I do this? Well, then it becomes a bad spirit in you, doesn't it? And when Joshua began to see that, he said, remember? And when they cried out unto the Lord, he put darkness between you and the Egyptians and brought the sea upon them and covered them. He was saying, remember when you cried out? So even Joshua was preaching this message way back then. We see in the book of Judges, the whole book of Judges is about God sending the children of Israel a deliverer. The judge is a deliverer. 
We know from examples like Othniel and Ehud and Deborah, Gideon, Samson, just to name a few, we know that these were the judges. But if you go back, you're going to notice something. I noticed that as I was studying this, do you know that God sent those judges to them after they did one thing that they all had in common? They cried out to the Lord. That means when it got so bad, they couldn't do anything about it. They cried out to the Lord and God sent them someone. But they never got sent anyone until they passed the stage of just thinking they're okay. Knowing they're not okay and then crying out. You see, God would make it good for them. And when he made it good for them, they would forget about God and they would start to worship other gods and they would start to just live as good as they could and they would enjoy all this stuff. And then God would say, something else has to happen because you guys are not crying out to me anymore. You see, God doesn't have to have us just cry out in need. He wants us to cry out just in praise. But sometimes we forget about God and he, he graciously sends something in our life that we can't figure out. Why does he do that? So that we'll cry out to him. Why? He can't answer until we cry out. For that person that's here today, that's never accepted the Lord Jesus Christ as their Savior, or they're not sure they have, or they know that there's a God, but they've never had that moment in their life where they've realized, hey, listen, I'm lost. I'm a sinner. I'm separated by God, from God. You know, Jesus died for you, and the Bible says he died for you to take away your sins, and you have to believe in him to do that. The Bible says in Revelation 3.20, Behold, I stand on the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and answer my knocking, I'll come unto him. You see, God's going to put situations that knock in our lives. We have to answer. How do we answer? We cry out to him. There was a man in the beginning of Luke 18 that cried out to God when he realized he was lost. He was called the public and he said, God, be merciful to me. I'm a sinner. He cried out to God. But David, I can really relate to David. Can anybody here relate to David? David had ups and David had downs. David had good days. David had rough days. Oh, David. He was on top of the mountain. He was really in the valley. But at this particular time when David was writing this, he, he had experience in what he was talking about because David, understand for some part of his life, David was hunted down as an animal by King Saul. At other times in his life, even his own son that wanted to be king was threatening his life. He had to hide in caves. David was on the run. He felt alone. He felt like his life was in turmoil. He felt like everything went wrong. He knew he didn't deserve it. And sometimes things happen to us to make us cry that we didn't even do. We had nothing to do with it. It just happened. It wasn't even our fault. David was doing what God wanted him to do. And all of a sudden, this misfortune. Listen, Psalms 18, verse 6. David said, in my distress, I called upon the Lord. Listen, I cried unto my God. He heard my voice out of his temple, and my cry came before him, even unto his ears. What is David saying? David is saying that God heard him. You say, is that important? Well, it's very important. Why would I even cry out to someone that wouldn't hear me? I wouldn't. David summed up his testimony in life in Psalms 34, 6. Here's a man that had everything in the world with wealth one time. This is what he cried out. He called himself. He said, this poor man cried. Who was he calling poor? Himself. This poor man cried, and the Lord heard him and saved him out of all of his troubles. Now, let me ask you so I can see if this is applicable. Anybody in here ever had troubles? David said, this poor man cried and the Lord heard him and saved him out of all of his trouble. David is saying, I am this poor man, describing himself as someone who was in trouble. Listen, no matter what you have, no matter what you own, when life is discouraging to you and you have trouble, you know how you feel? Poor, right? But what does he mean poor? You don't have the means by which to buy yourself out of this situation. This poor man cried, well... Anyone can cry out for help, but the difference is he cried out to God for help. This was David's testimony about the greatest resource that he has as a believer, his ability to cry out. Now, did you hear that? Now, if I were to ask you today, the last time that you witnessed to somebody or what you've heard about God, and somebody says, hey, listen, you need to, to come and hear the gospel. You need to give your life to Christ. You need to be saved. 
And you begin to give that person reasons why. We give reasons like this. You know, you want to be saved because you don't want to go to hell. You want to go to heaven. That's a pretty good reason. You want to be saved because God can bless you. That's a good reason. Let me give you the number one reason. The greatest thing that we're given in our salvation today is the ability to cry out to God. Did you hear that? Now, how many people would have put that on the top of your list? The reason we don't is because we take it for granted. The ability to cry out to God. David put himself in this situation. He said, this poor man, guess what? I see myself as this poor man. Everything that I own, everything that I've done, everything that that is about me, you know, I'm a dot on the globe. I'm one man. I'm here in this little town of Rockwell, in this little county of Rowan, in this little state called North Carolina, in this little country called the United States of America on this little globe in God's great big world. I'm a dot. As a matter of fact, if you made that dot, you would have to dissect it a thousand times or maybe 10,000 times to get to about how big I am. But yet, I am a child of God because I've accepted the blood of Jesus Christ. I became a child of God. So when this poor man cries, God hears even this one little man. Glory to God. That is the greatest thing about being saved. I might be nobody to the billions and billions of people, but I am somebody to him. When this poor man cries, I am his child. He hears me. That's big. So why in the world do I not take advantage of that asset and I choose to just cry instead of crying out? You see, this is a resource that I believe people overlook on a daily basis, even though the Bible consistently tells us that lives change and situations change when people cry out to God. So today I want to look at a story in the Bible where we see a man cry out to Jesus in his time of trouble. We need to see several things about this, and it probably won't all happen in one sermon. But the first thing I want us to see is the condition that he was in. What kind of trouble was he in? Number two, the opposition that he faced. You know, trouble a lot of times comes and then you have opposition in order to get out of that trouble. Number three, I want us to see the strength of his faith in Jesus. Number four, the reaction of Jesus when he cried out to him. And number five, the change that happened in his lives and the lives of all those people around him. So in Luke 18, we see the story of a blind man. Now we're going to read Luke's version. We'll probably refer to Mark's version, the Synoptic Gospels. Mark chapter 10 goes along with Luke chapter 18. You'll see the same account given. Jesus was traveling, preaching, healing, doing miracles, teaching, having his disciples sit down and teach them some things, having the crowds, and the crowds followed him. And so Jesus would go from town to town and people would follow. And there were throngs of people that went after him. And he would stop and heal somebody or stop and teach this or gather the people around him. And in the midst of all this, he approached the town of Jericho. And there was a blind man there. And this blind man... Luke calls him a certain blind man. Bartimaeus is his name according to Mark. Mark calls him Bartimaeus. So as we read this story, I want you to be able to see what happened that day. You might say, well, I've heard this story before. I've heard it too, many, many times, but I don't think I ever was able to see this until it was laid on my heart. Hopefully God will speak it to you. Luke chapter 18, we'll read verses 34 through 43. The Bible says in verse 34, And they understood none of these things, and this saying was hid from them. Neither knew they the things which were spoken. You say, well, that's not the beginning of the story. In my Bible, it doesn't start to verse 35. Verse 34 is very important. We'll refer back to it because it talks about those people that were following him, even the disciples. It said that they understood none of these things. Now we get to the story. Verse 35, it says, And it came to pass that as he was come nigh to Jericho, a certain blind man sat by the wayside begging. And hearing the multitude pass by, he asked what it meant. And they told him that Jesus of Nazareth passeth by. And he cried out, saying, Jesus, thou son of David, have mercy on me. And they which went before him rebuked him that he should hold his peace. But he cried so much more. Thou son of David, have mercy on me. 
And Jesus stood and commanded him to be brought unto him. And when he was come near, he asked him, saying, What wilt thou that I shall do unto thee? And he said, Lord, that I may receive my sight. And Jesus said unto him, Receive thy sight, thy faith have made thee. And immediately he received his sight and followed him, glorifying God. And all the people, when they saw it, gave praise to God. You may say, I've heard this story before. This is the story of Jesus healing a blind man. We know Jesus could heal the blind. We know that he could raise the dead. We know that he could make the cripple to walk. He could do all kinds of miracles. What's so important about this particular story? What's so important about this story is not what Jesus did. You say, well, it is. It's the story of the miracle of him healing the blind man. It is not. And I don't know that I ever saw that until I began to look deeper into it. I could think about Jesus healing that blind man, and guess how long that thought would last? It would last about 10 seconds. Jesus healed the blind man. Why would it only last 10 seconds? I have no idea how he could heal a blind man. Do you believe Jesus healed that blind man? Sure. Okay. Do you know how he did it? Do you believe Jesus can heal a cripple? Do you know how he does it? Do you know that Jesus could raise the dead? Now, do you know how he did it? We have no idea how he does it. So our mind stops right there. Yes, Jesus healed. And glory to God, it's great to see the miracles. But I can't think past that point. The only person that I can put myself in the shoes of is Bartimaeus. So I'm not, I'm not thinking that Jesus wanted us to focus on his miracle. In a minute, he's going to be able to tell us that it wasn't what he did anyway. So he's trying to tell us here. Look at this story. There's something you're not seeing. There's something that we're taking for granted. And I think it's all right here. What we can understand is that Bartimaeus did something that we have an opportunity to do. He cried out to Jesus, believing in Jesus' power to heal his situation. Do you know that every person has an opportunity to cry out to Jesus to heal their situation? You can't understand how Jesus does it, but you know you're like him there's something that's probably wrong with you. There's some trouble you have. What was his trouble? He was what? He was blind. So as we talk about him today, you'll see how you're able to relate yourself to him. We can understand about Bartimaeus several problems that he had. Number one, he was blind. Number two, he was poor. You say, how do you know he was poor? He was begging, wasn't he? Alms. Alms. Anybody. Anybody help me. I'm blind. I can't do any better. I can't get anywhere. Please give me something. Who? Right here. Can you give me something? Please. I can't see. I can't work. I can't do this. Please. Can you give? Oh, can you give me something? He was poor and he was begging. Was it his fault? We're not told that it was his fault. He was just blind. It just happened. The problem is he couldn't fix it by himself. At least he thought he couldn't. How many of us can relate to Bartimaeus? We found ourselves in situations in life and it seems like our situation is never going to change. And we find ourselves crying. Is it, is it ever going to get any better? I've tried this, I've tried this, it's just not changing. You ever found yourself there, have you? Why is this happening to me? Why isn't it happening to everybody else? Why isn't my situation changing? I was struggling with this years ago. I'm still struggling with it now. It's just not changing. Well, that's no different than his situation. We see in this story that we have a choice in the matter. And this is what we talk about today. We can sit and beg for help to survive in our situation. Or we can cry out to Jesus believing in his power to deliver us out of our situation. Do you know that sometimes we get so content in our situation and we get so complacent that we are satisfied just to sit and say, I guess this is the way it's going to be. But Bartimaeus chose to do what David did. Remember what David said? This poor man cried out to God and he heard me and delivered me out of his troubles. This is what David did. I want you to look at couple of verses here that are key verse 35 i want you to notice where we find blind bartimaeus or a certain blind man as luke calls him 
I want you to look at verse 35. A certain blind man, I want you to look at this, this three-letter word. A certain blind man did what? He sat. What was he doing? Somebody would say, what's he doing there? He's begging. No, first thing that you're told is that he's sitting. He sat. You say, you're going to, make, so you're going to spiritualize this verse? I don't have to. How hard is it to sit? You having a hard time sitting out there? How hard is it to sit? You know, sometimes when the Lord leads and I'm up here for a long time, when I get through and I get down from there, all I want to do is sit because it takes no effort, right? But if you're standing or you're on your feet, it takes effort, doesn't it? He sat. You say, well, he's blind. Give him the benefit of the doubt. No, he just sat. Didn't say he was crippled. He was blind. He sat. That was his place. He took his place. And guess what he did? He sat in his problem saying, I'm blind, I'm going to sit here, and my hope is that somebody will come by, anybody, I don't know who it is, and just be able to help me. So as he sat, he begged, alms, alms. He looked to the world to be able to get him, not out of his problem, but just help him survive. And sometimes we find ourselves in that same way. We get in a situation, we stay in that situation so long, we're not even looking to be delivered. We're just hoping to survive day by day. You say, well, hey, I don't want to ask for too much. You're going to see here where God says, hey, cry out to me. Don't just sit. You see, there's no hope in sitting. There's just crying. When you sit, It is a non-active movement, right? That's a pretty big word. He sat and begged. I want you to notice some key things and ask you this question. Do you know that sometimes we can sit in our bad situation so long that we just begin to say, this is the way life's going to be? We're no different than he is? But see, something happened in verses 36 and 37. The Bible says, and hearing the multitudes pass by, he asked what it meant. And they told him that Jesus of Nazareth passed by. See, the story gets deeper because, you see, the blind man couldn't see. But guess what he could do? He could hear. So as he heard the shuffling around and he knew people were going this way, he could hear. So he used what he could have, what he did have, his hearing. Even though he didn't have sight, he could have stayed and just said, Doesn't pertain to me. I don't care where they're going. I'm blind. I can't get there anyway. So I'm not even going to use what I hear. He used what he heard. And he asked, where's everybody going? Where's everybody going? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth is passing by. And we see verse 38. When we read verse 38, let's read it together. Pretty big verse. It says, and he cried, saying, Jesus, thou son of David, have mercy on me. Let's go to the streets right before you enter into Jericho today. You want to? You want to go? You need a picture, right? You can see this man sitting in his place. He's there every day. He's begging for anyone in the world to help him. Where's this going to come from? He has no idea each day how he's going to get through and he's just wanting to exist. And that's the way we get sometimes when we're in our problem, right? Well, maybe this doctor can tell me something or maybe this will happen at work or maybe this will. And we live with just this doubtful hope and it doesn't deliver us out of our fear. It doesn't deliver anything. It's just a maybe kind of thing. And this man that day heard that Jesus was passing by and all of a sudden he had a reaction. Jesus is passing by. So when he heard Jesus is passing by, do you know what he began to do? When it says he cried, it doesn't mean that he sat there and put his head between his knees and said I'm blind and Jesus is passing by and I'm not going to get to see him this man that day rose up from his seat he stopped sitting he stopped begging and he said Jesus 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 well, what could he do he couldn't see him he couldn't go anywhere what could he do tell me one thing he could do that day cry out his options were gone so he cried out Jesus you know I took some action to do that didn't it 
Here this blind man was saying, he's coming, he's coming. We preach a lot about second chances, don't we? And praise God for second chances. But listen, this man that day, this man said, I'm blind. I've heard about this man. This is not my second chance. This is my last chance. The only man that can fix me is coming to town. And he's going to know. I'm going to cry out to him in desperation. Jesus! I'm blind over here. Jesus! But he didn't just cry out in desperation. He cried out in belief. He said, Jesus, thou son of David. What does that mean? This man, Bartimaeus, knew who Jesus was. He had heard about him. Thou son of David means he recognized him as the Messiah, the son of God, the promised one that came to take the sin of the world away, who was wounded for his transgressions, bruised for his iniquity. He had heard that. He believed in this man. His statement of belief was Jesus, the son of David. Come to find out, Bartimaeus could see better than a lot of those other people. You say, what do you mean? Well, I want to take you back to where we started the story. Verse 34, it starts and said, they understood none of these things that Jesus was saying unto them. Bartimaeus, he knew, last chance. You know, there's times, I've told you this before, but I pray constantly pray today before the sermon got this prayer written in my office i i want to live this prayer god if this is the last time that i get to preach today this is the last message i ever deliver god please let me deliver it the way you want me to deliver it and God, if this is the last time that person is sitting out there, they're going to hear the gospel and have an opportunity to get saved. Let them hear the gospel today. If this is their last chance, let it come to them. Amen. If this is the last chance they have to step out of what they're doing and confess it to you and come back to you, even as your child, let them do it. If this is the last chance, you see, we pray differently when it's the last chance, don't we? There's a sense of urgency. This man knew Jesus was coming to down and he was a believer. This man could heal him. You see, he, he recognized him as the Messiah, but we see something key happened. He stopped sitting and he stopped crying. He stopped crying out alms. He stopped trying, crying out, hey, anybody, just help me. Somebody help me. Somebody help me. And he started crying out to Jesus, hey, Jesus. I believe this is a lesson for us. But he cried out in humility. Do you know what his cry was? Have mercy. Have mercy on me. You see, when we stay in a state of crying, we'll cry out to Jesus and say, Jesus, you know this isn't my fault. You know this is going on and that's going on and, and I've got this problem and that problem and I pray for them that they would do better. He cried out the same way the publican did. Have mercy on me. I'm a humble man. I don't deserve. You know what mercy is? Mercy is different than grace. Grace is what God gives us that we don't deserve. Mercy is what God doesn't give us that we do deserve. He didn't deserve to see. He didn't deserve to live. Neither do we. I'm a sinner. But God shows mercy on me. So he cried out for mercy and he said, Jesus, have mercy on me. You say, you think Jesus knew he was there? <laughs> what do you think? But I will tell you this. Jesus would have entered and left his town. And blind Bartimaeus would have still been blind if he wouldn't have cried out to Jesus. And a lot of us have Jesus walk by us every Sunday, every day we come to worship, every day we have a chance to do it. And he's wanting to heal us, but we fail to cry out. You know what we like to do? We like to stay in a crying mode. Nothing wrong with crying. It's going to happen. But if you never get past that mode and get to the crying out to Jesus, then the problem never changes. It's a natural reaction. It's going to happen. I think it's neat. In verse 39, we see that there was opposition to him crying out to Jesus. Read this with me. And they that went before him rebuked him that he should hold his peace. You know what that means? Be quiet. Shh. That's Jesus. Be quiet. You blind beggar, quit.
We need to know that when we, when we decide to stop just sitting, we decide to cry out to Jesus, you'll face opposition. I want you to remember what he began to cry out. Jesus! Do you know that today, the one name that devil wants to shut out of everybody's mouth is the name of Jesus? You know, the Bible tells us there's no other name underneath heaven whereby men must be saved. You know, the Bible tells us that the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that he is Lord. The Bible tells us there's one way to get to God. His name is Jesus, right? So there's opposition when you cry out the name Jesus, isn't there? There's opposition to you praying. You see, when we cry out to Jesus, it's not you going out of here and crying out in that voice like I'm crying out. I'm doing that, for example, this morning. It's not you shouting Jesus. You can shout Jesus by getting on your knees and crying out to Him. You can shout Jesus at home when you go to your prayer closet and you pray to Him. You can shout Jesus anywhere, but He wants to know that you believe, like Bartimaeus, that He can heal you. He preached another message to some guys that he healed, and he says, be it unto you according to your belief. Bartimaeus had no doubt that he could heal him. He cried out the name Jesus, and he was opposed. They said, be quiet, man. Shh. You know, this is not so much different than us. Do You know, there's a lot of people that would rather see you sit and beg than they would to see you cry out to Jesus. They want you to be the mercy of the government, the mercy of them, the mercy of whoever is in control of you. They don't want you healed out of your situation. They didn't want him, did they? Be quiet. He didn't care. I love the next part. It says, and after they told him that, he cried out all the much more. Get out of my way. Jesus! They said for me not to yell, but I'm going to cry out to you. This is how bad I want you. I love it. He had a strength in his faith, didn't he? He cried so the much more. And if you go back to verse 34, you'll see those, those people, sadly enough, were people that were following Jesus that didn't know what he was talking about. All they knew was just the, the pomp and circumstance of Jesus coming to town. You know, that happens in church life. Let's come in and let's come to church and let's sing these things. Listen, this man was worshiping more than all these other people. Why? He was sincere. He was crying out to Jesus. Well, it's just not proper for him to do that. I'm sick of proper churches. Amen. Bartimaeus wasn't proper that day. He said, quit, man, quit. Let me tell you what that got him. I want you to notice verse 40. This man stops sitting. He stops crying. And he starts crying out. You see, he went from crying to crying out. I want you to tell the person beside of you, he went from crying to crying out. I want you to notice what happens when someone is told not to cry out to Jesus, but they cry out to him even stronger. Verse 40, listen to these words. And Jesus stood. Are you still in that street? Get this, there was a throng of people following Jesus and he had preached that and he had healed that and he had done this and he's coming into Jericho and everybody's watching him and all of a sudden, all of a sudden, he hears this sound coming from over here. Jesus! Jesus! Now you know it was loud. You know everybody was saying, hey, there he is, there he is. You heard all the shuffle. But all of a sudden, he heard this believer crying out. And it's no different when he hears this little dot in the world or your little dot cry out to him. Jesus stood. How cool is that? My problem is not too big to him. I'm not going to be shuffled into the mix with the rest of the world. He heard Bartimaeus cry out and he stood. That means he stopped what he was doing. I hear one of mine. I hear one of mine. You know, Jesus could read his heart before he got to it. Those others that were saying, be quiet, be quiet. You know, they're no different than those Pharisees. When they brought Jesus into, you remember Palm Sunday. Let's go to Easter a second, okay? We always talk about Palm Sunday. He came in 
riding on a donkey and they were singing Hosanna. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And they were crying out. And the Pharisees came up to Jesus and they said, they're saying you're the king. Make them be quiet. Make them be quiet. Make them stop saying it. That's the picture that came to my mind when I was listening to those religious people say, Shh, stop saying that. Stop crying out. Listen, you know what Jesus told those people that day? He said, if they don't cry out, the rocks themselves will cry out and praise me. Somebody's going to praise him. But yet me and you, in the midst of our trouble, sometimes forget that we have the ability not to just sit in it, but to stand up and cry out in belief, right? We could stay in that trouble forever, just accepting it or blaming it on something else or saying this is just the way it is or I can't get any relief. But listen, Jesus comes by you. You see, Jesus wants us to cry out to him. You say, how do you know? Well, he made it clear. Jesus said in Matthew 7, ask and you shall receive. How do you receive unless you ask? He made another statement in John 6. He says, him that cometh to me, listen, I will in no wise cast out. I will not turn a blind ear or a deaf ear till you're crying out to me. And in Luke 19, 40, as we hear that Jesus said, hey, listen. I want them to cry out to me. If they don't cry out to me, the rocks are going to cry out. He's making his point. He's saying, hey, come to me, all you that labor and are heavy laden. I'll give you rest. Come to me. Yell out to me. Cry out to me. Get on your knees and pray to me, however you want to say it. It seems to me, I look back at my life and I see that I try so many options before I cry out to him. And it seems like our crying out to him comes always in desperation times, doesn't it? It's those desperation times when we have to get to that last chance thing. And all he's looking for is sincere belief. You see, the blind man was the only one in the whole crowd that day that stopped Jesus because he cried out to him in faith and in belief. And Jesus didn't just stop. He turned to the man and he asked him, What would thou have that I shall do unto thee? Tell me what you want me to do for you, in other words. To translate that, what do you want me to do for you? Do you think Jesus knew what he wanted? Guess what? Bartimaeus didn't have sight, but Jesus wanted him to use his voice. You know what he wanted him to do? Ask me what you want. You say, that's simple. We trip over it every single day. Don't think what you want. Don't suppose what you want. Don't plan what you want. Ask what you want. He saw a blind man being led to him. He knew he was blind. What do you think he wanted, Jesus? I knew what he wanted before I came to this town. I need him to ask me. And Jesus said unto him, Listen, receive thy sight. Thy faith has made thee whole. That's Mark's version. Luke said, receive thy sight, thy faith hath saved thee. You see, his faith was expressed to Jesus when he cried out to Jesus. His faith was expressed when he stopped sitting and begging the world and started crying out to Jesus, the only one that could fix him. His faith was expressed when he cried out to Jesus, even though others said to be quiet. He believed in Jesus' power as the Son of God. You see, his faith was expressed in all these things. The ironic thing is that Jesus didn't say that it was his touch that was going to heal the blind man. I noticed this is pretty neat. You know, Jesus could have said, Bartimaeus, here, come here, son. I want to touch your eyes. I want to be able to say this over you. I want to be able to heal you today. You say, well, Jesus did heal him. Well, he healed him because he cried out to him. But guess where the healing was? The healing was in Bartimaeus himself. He said, what do you mean? Jesus said, receive thy sight. Thy faith hath made thee whole. Not something I did. Your belief in me made you whole today. Your belief in you gave your sight. Well, is this a big deal? Yes, it is. Because day after day after week after month that he sat there blind, he could have been healed. How does that apply to us? Oh, me. Oh, me. How many of us are living in the situation in trouble with the power inside of us to cry out to Jesus? 
You see, the healing, he said, thy faith have made thee whole. Because you had faith, it's nothing for me to heal it, but I can't do it unless you ask. I can't do it unless you cry out. I can't do it unless you have faith. Is this making sense? How good is that? He basically said, your faith in me is what's going to change your situation. And that's what he says to you today. Your faith in God is what's going to change your situation, not the different variables of your situation. You have something in front of you that you want to work out, that you need to work out, that you have to have worked out, the, something that, that you can't control. You can only hope or guess about it. You've got one option. Cry out to Jesus if you want it to work. Or you can just cry. It didn't work. It shouldn't have been. I can't believe this happened. Why is this happening to me? Why is this going this way? Listen, things are going to happen. And our natural response is to cry. But when that crying turns to resentment or complaining or disgruntledness or discouragement, then it's not going to heal us. We've got to cry out to Him because the healing is in us to begin with. It's our belief in His power to heal. That's big, guys. I hope you got it. You say, well, eventually you could see. No, my Bible says immediately He received His sight. How, oft, how quickly? Immediately. Immediately he received his sight and followed him. What did we read today? What did we hear? What we heard today was the story of a blind man that stopped crying and started crying out. Now I will guarantee you, I've been a part of some things, I've witnessed some things, I've heard some things, I've been with some of you through some things that were just bad situations. And what do we do at bad situations? We cry. Nothing wrong with that. But the day it changed for this man is when he stopped sitting and crying and started crying out. His situation changed. We'll talk more about his situation the next time we meet, but I thought, you know, Jesus stood and listened and answered the call of this blind man that cried out to him, just like David said. This poor man cried, and the Lord heard him and delivered him out of his trouble. Now, maybe you don't have troubles, and maybe you never have, but if you do or if you have, you might want to pay attention to this. I paid attention to it because I thought, you know, I've been right there going up into the streets of Jericho, you say, oh, did you go on the Holy Land tour? No, I'm talking about right here. What do you mean? I want to tell you about a guy in closing. He got saved. He was right with God. He got away from God. And when he got away from God, he stopped crying out altogether, stopped praying, distanced himself from God. God loved him so much he pursued him. He sought him. And as he pursued him, he said, what is it going to take you to come back to me? What is it going to take you to come back to me? This guy that lost everything you can lose. He had trouble with his relationships. He had trouble with himself. He wasn't happy. He lived every day disgruntled. No matter what he made, it took that much more. No matter what he thought was precious, it seemed like it was taken away. He felt alone in the world. This guy was me. And God would have one thing that, that I could have turned to him, but I didn't. I just sat and cried. And he would have the next one. I just sat and cried, and my crying wasn't external. There were several years in my life where I lost the ability to cry. My heart was so hard. I was around people that I, were loved ones to me, and these people passed away, and I'm with family and friends at the funeral, and I'm thinking, man, everybody else is crying. It'd, be nice. It'd just really be good if I could have a tear work up right now because it looks like I'm cold-hearted. I was cold-hearted. But I was crying on the inside. I was crying, God, this ain't fair. When is it ever going to change? I'm so lonely. Nothing's working out for me. 
I'm not happy with this. I'm not happy with that. Just miserable, just sitting and crying. I guess this is the way it's going to be for me. I'm going to lead a lonely, poor, uneventful life separated from the things I love and I just can't do any better. So how is the world going to help me? Maybe the world should just give me this or maybe this is going to happen. It was all just nothing but just begging something to happen. And when life got so bad that I wanted to step out of it and it just stung to be alive, I remembered that I was a child of God and it was my last chance because my mind was telling me to leave. It's, it's going to be over. My last chance. I got on my face in my lonely apartment on that floor and I cried out to God. This poor man cried and the Lord heard his voice and he delivered me out of my trouble. Amen. He set my feet upon a solid rock. Amen. He gave me a place to stand. And he gave me another chance. And I drew near him. Do you know that journey right now? You say, where's that journey now? Standing right in front of you. And it changed when I stopped crying. And started crying out. So I've been Bartimaeus before. You say, well. He's talking about receiving his spiritual sight. I'm really going to disagree with you. He gave him physical sight that day. That was his trouble. He was a child of God. He knew it. He was a believer. But he was stuck in this rut because he would cry but not cry out. There's a group called Third Day that sings a song called Cry Out to Jesus. One of my favorite songs. The course of that song says there's hope for the helpless. But I was helpless. Maybe you're helpless today. You feel like I don't know where the help's coming from. There's rest for the weary. I can tell you, you get tired of just sitting and begging life to give you something. There's love for the broken heart. There's nothing worse than when your heart's broken. There's grace and forgiveness. There's mercy and healing. All those things we need. Grace and forgiveness and God to have his mercy, just like Bartimaeus said. And we all need healing. You might not be physical blind, but you need your situation healed. And then it says he'll meet you wherever you are. Jesus came to Bartimaeus' town that day. But Bartimaeus had to cry out. Song, chorus ends, cry out to Jesus, cry out to Jesus. And I would ask you today, when is the last time you really cried out to Jesus? Believing in his power to heal your situation, not as an option, not as a third, fourth option, not saying, okay, well, listen, if this doesn't work out, if this doesn't work out, or God, it hasn't, but cried out to him. Jesus! Believe in your power to heal. And you don't have to do it the way I just did it. You do it by coming to him and humbling your heart. Praying to God and just saying, Jesus, I come to God through you. And I need healing. You may be here today and you're a Christian. You know you cried out to Jesus that initial time and you said, Jesus, I'm lost and he healed you of your sinful state. He gave you salvation. He gave you a relationship with him. He gave you the ability to cry out to him, which is the greatest thing. But you can honestly say, listen, I don't do it enough. Sometimes I find myself in the same old spot, just wishing this would get better, hoping this happens, or maybe this will happen, or maybe it's physical, maybe it's financial, maybe it's relationship-wise, maybe it's job-wise, maybe it's something, maybe it's my marriage, maybe it's my children. There's something in my life, I just hope it gets better. It's just sitting and begging, man. And as Christians, we find ourselves just sitting and begging something out of the blue to happen. When we have a resource like Jesus Christ to cry out to like Bartimaeus did and said, Jesus, have mercy upon my situation. Because when you stand in front of Jesus, he said, your faith 
is what healed this situation. Your power in believing that I'm the only one that could do it. No matter what opposition you faced. I don't know how he does it. But I don't have to. I just believe that he can. And you may be here today and you've never accepted the Lord as your Savior or you're unsure. So it's not just knowing that you're in the crowd when Jesus passes by. That first time you've got to cry out to him and say, Jesus, be merciful to me. I'm a sinner. Jesus, thou son of David, I believe you came and died for me. Forgive me of my sins. Save me in that day. Guess what? Your belief is what will save you. What he did is what you have to believe. He died on the cross for you. He substituted his life for you. So where do you find yourself today? Are you listening today? Maybe you're here. Maybe you're listening on the radio. Maybe you just plugged the CD in and this is speaking to you and you realize, man, I've gotten busy. I forgot that I had an option that is just available to me and I'm as important as anybody. I'm that dot that he hears when I cry out Jesus. And you're realizing it today. As a Christian, you're saying, listen, I'm going to cry out to him right now. Guess what? He'll hear you. And if you're here today and you're lost, listen, you need to cry out to him that first time so that you can continue to cry out to him for the rest of your life. Amen. Amen. So I looked back and I diagnosed my life problem. What was my life problem for all those years when life was horrible? It was miserable. There was no happiness. There was no joy. There was no contentment. There was dissatisfaction. There was discouragement. There was no will to live. There was nothing there that brought me any peace. What was my problem? My problem is I chose to cry instead of cry out. If you find yourself in that situation today or know someone in that situation. Use this time in the invitation to cry out to God. Stand with me, please. Page 300, 300.
was good to go to the house of the Lord today, wasn't it? Amen. I thank him always for speaking to us out of his word. I thank him always for seeing where we're at and knowing what we need to hear. I praise him. I praise him for hearing us when we cry out to him. And every one of us are in that same state. And every one of us will stay in that same state until we go by this example that he's given us. I love you. I thank you for listening so intently today. I thank you for coming today. I pray that you'll come back this evening at 6 o'clock and join us. We're going to have a good time in the Lord. Now, if you don't want to have a good time in the Lord, this is not the place you need to be this evening. There's probably something that you can do that will be better, I'm sure, right? Wrong. No. you have a good time in the Lord if you come back this evening. I love you. Any announcements before we leave? Anybody? Will you dismiss this place?